Good morning. Welcome to the Swedish House of Finance. Uh, my name is Per Wiesel and I will be moderating the seminar this morning. Swedish House of Finance is it's called a national financial center, uh, meaning that we do research in financial economics and we arrange conferences, seminars and stuff with the financial sector in Stockholm. And this is obviously such an event. Today the topic uh, for the seminar is how is the real economy affected by higher capital requirements for banks? And we are very happy to have Professor Steven Cicchetti, uh, who is Professor of Econo International Economic at the Brandeis International Business School. He has served as Economic Advisor and Head of the Monetary and Economic Department at the Bank of International Settlements in Basel. And so he has worked with creating, formulating the rules and the regulations that we will be discussing. His research interests include monetary policy, economics of financial regulation, macroeconomic theory, price and inflation measurement, and he has published, uh, among other things, a leading textbook in money and banking. So Professor Cicchetti will start this off with a 30-minute uh, presentation on, on, on this topic, and after that, Martin uh, Flodén, who is deputy governor of the Central Bank and a professor of economics at the Stockholm University, we have, we'll have, have 10 minutes for comments, and after that, Martin Blåberg, uh, working at Han Handelsbanken, who is head of financial control at Handelsbanken. He has had various positions at Handelsbanken over the years and has also worked with the Finansinstitutionen, the fi FSA, and the Central Bank in Sweden. So he also has a broad background in this topic. So when we've done that, we will have something like 20 minutes left for questions or comments. And I really encourage you to take the opportunity. It doesn't have to be questions even, I mean comments, whatever you feel like or, or feel like discussing. We would very much encourage you to do that. So once again, very much welcome and especially warm welcome to Professor Cicchetti. Come all the way to dark Stockholm at this time of the year. Welcome on stage. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, um, so this is uh, this is this is really a discussion about the differences in view between the official sector and the private sector. Uh, and um, if I start. In 2010, for some sins in a previous life, um, I was asked to do a study of the impact of higher capital requirements on macroeconomic activity. Uh, I was asked to do this by the Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Board. And, uh, and of course, the question was, how do you do this? Um, so we sort of made up all sorts of ways of doing it. Um, and we came up with a bunch of answers. And then at the same time, this thing called the um, International Institute of Finance, which some of you I'm sure are familiar with, uh, is a, basically a lobbying organization for large global banks. Um, they did a study as well. Um, it was a very different style, but that doesn't really matter. Um, and the the... The differences in the estimates of the impact of the higher capital requirements were quite stark. Um, the official sector estimate was that if we implemented the Basel III capital requirements, which are quite a, quite, quite a bit higher than pre-crisis 2006 agreed capital requirements, I'll show you in a few minutes how much higher, uh, that it would have only a very modest impact on macroeconomic activity, while the private sector's estimate was that the world was going to effectively come to an end as we knew it. The difference was three percentage points of GDP decline relative to baseline uh, rather than a quarter of a percentage point. So those were the, that was the range, okay? And that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big difference. Um, 
So I guess I could stop right now and say, well, the world didn't come to an end. Everybody has higher capital, and so why are we all so worried about this? But, uh, but I think that uh, I think we have a little bit. I have a little bit more to say about this. So um, it's it's great to it's great to be um, doing this in a at the Stockholm School of Economics because um, because I can talk about the economist's view of this. So the first thing is that the first thing I want to say is that when a when a banker comes and tells you that capital is expensive relative to alternative funding mechanisms, they're telling the truth. Okay, they're not just making it up. It is expensive for them. Uh, but it's private. That they're telling you their private cost. They're not telling you the social cost of capital. And the reason that capital is expensive to them has to do with a lot of distortions that we've built into the system. It has to do with tax distortions, the differential taxation of debt and equity. It has to do with limited liability and government guarantees, which have the same basic impact of giving the owners an, of the bank a put option to put the bank back to the public sector in the event of insolvency. Uh, that gives them, I mean, the first one just drives a wedge between the costs of equity and, and debt. The second one um, means that they're going to want to run this thing um, with as little capital as possible because it gives them the highest option value they can possibly get. Okay, and then they're also going to take a lot of risk. The third one, which was the one that was, that I, I guess I, I find interesting, po possibly because it was something that I, I hadn't realized until I got deeper into this um, several years ago, I guess, well, now more years ago than I want to remember, but, um, but the, the, the last one is that, is that investors, especially institutional investors, um, they reward banks for taking on leverage. So if you go to your like introductory finance class, in your introductory fi finance class, at, somebody, at some point early, very early on, somebody says something like, if you take more risk, then you have higher. Ex you have to ha reward people with higher expected return. Okay, and so risk and risk and and return, uh, expected return should be positively related. Okay, so that suggests that if you reduce, so naively I thought, if I reduce the riskiness of a bank, that then they should be able to operate at a lower level of expected return and people would be equally happy, okay? Um, so yeah, there's distortions that arise from this option value associated with, uh, with limited liability and government guarantees that want people to take more risk, but the investors in this should be, uh, should be, there should be some way in which they're indifferent. This turns out to be wrong. There's a perverse impact of this because a lot of institutional investors have restrictions on their own ability to issue debt. So imagine that you're running a pension fund. That's a, the best example, um, or, or something like that, or you're an asset manager, and you would like to issue debt. You would like to leverage yourself. But you can't because either, either, your, um, either the requirements under which you're actually operating and your agreement with your investor says you're not going to issue debt, or there's some legal restriction on your issuance of debt. Well, what's the second best thing that you can do? If you can't issue debt yourself, you buy a leveraged asset. And you mix that leveraged asset in with all your other stuff, and your portfolio effectively behaves as if you yourself are levered. And you're willing to reward the people that take the leverage for this. You're willing to pay for this, essentially. And in paying for that, well, in paying for that, what you do is you break, at least at the margin, this relationship that we all thought was sort of hardwired that we learned in introductory finance. And what better way to get leverage, what more leveraged entity that can you find than a commercial bank? Right? A bank is a a bank is very highly leveraged, right? In, in the even today, I guess I'm standing in a place where your banks are leveraged 20 plus to one. It's a striking number, but okay. 
Um, and uh, in other parts of the world, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's similar. The U.S. is not. The U.S. is lower. But that, that doesn't matter. So investors are, so the point here is that this is all about private costs, though it's not about social costs. And so what we want to do, though, is we can go and ask ourselves whether or not the social costs are, bigger, are big or small for this. And one would expect that since a lot of these things are various distortions in the system, that those social costs might not be very big. So what I want to do is I'm going to first talk about what's happened to capital in the banking systems around the world, and then I'm going to talk about what's happened to bank profitability and macroeconomic activity. So the first thing is that left to their own devices, banks hold too little capital relative to what's socially optimal, for sure. Okay? And uh, the question then is whether they have social costs. Whoops, what happened? There we go. Okay. Oh, sorry. So I, I'm going I'm to talk about these four things. Capital requirements themselves, the level of bank capital, bank performance, and aggregate activity. And I'll go through each one of them pretty quickly. Okay. So the first one is, is the capital requirements themselves. So this is a, this is a, uh, these are rough approximations that, that I made um, several years ago of what the difference is between the bottom requirements and the Basel III capital requirements. So Basel III did, did, did a couple of really major things relative to Basel II. Okay, the first thing that it did was that it tightened the definition of capital. I'll, ta I'll talk about that in a second. And the second thing that it did was it increased the risk coverage. So what that meant was that I'm looking at the at a numerator and a denominator, right? So I'm looking at a ratio of bank capital to risk-weighted assets. If the risk coverage is better, the denominator's bigger. And if the definition of capital is more rigorous and tighter, the numerator is smaller, OK? So I can look and say, what if I take the Basel III definitions and apply them to Basel II? And what was the effective capital requirement under Basel II? using the Basel III definitions? And the answer uh, turns out to be definitely less than 1%, probably less than a half a percent. And you can compare that to the Basel III requirements of 8 to 10%. Okay? Now, people didn't have, most banks didn't have capital at these very, very low levels, but that was the requirement. Okay? Um, I'll give you one of my, my favorite example of something that was Call, was considered capital under Basel II that doesn't make any sense is deferred tax assets. So if a bank's making losses, then the tax authority allows them to carry forward those losses to write off on their taxes against future profits. Okay? Sort of makes sense, right? That turns out to be, in an accounting, in most accounting frameworks, that is an asset. The future, your ability to write off future profits is an asset today. Okay, that's fine. But is that, is that a buffer that creates resilience in the face of future losses? Is that something that, say, could be realized in insolvency? It seems pretty crazy to me to say that Deferred tax assets are loss absorbing in stress. So counting that as a counting that as an asset that then adds to capital, it seems to me is sort of silly. So that's that was changed. So a number of these things were changed. So now what I the, the message of the message of this calculation is very simple. When um, when you hear, as you do, authorities say that capital requirements have gone up by, at, by 10 times, what, you should, what you, you should immediately ask yourself is, relative to what? 10 times a very, very small number is not necessarily a big number. And so you really want to be careful with this. Um, because my question is whether the 8 to 10% range that we have now is actually high enough. Um, now, what's actually happened is that, um, is that ratios have gone up quite a lot. This is a, so th this is a complex calculation to do, and I didn't do it, but the Basel Committee itself 
does a um, semi-annual, twice a year, quantitative impact study where they survey, um, they, they actually in total survey about 200 banks, but only, um, I guess in this case, I think this chart is 92. This is a, this is a consistent sample. Um, they survey, this is 90, roughly 90 banks that have, um, that have tier one capital of three billion euros or more, okay? So these are not all really big banks by any stretch of the imagination, but they are the 100 or so 90 or so biggest banks in the world, okay? So that's the line, three billion euros for tier one capital. So if you're, if you're leveraged 20 or 25 to one, that means that these guys have assets in the range of 50 to 75 billion euros, okay? Again, not, not I mean, you know, if it was my wealth, I'd be like Bill Gates, but, um, but it's, uh, it's not a very big bank right, at all. Um, so they, cons they construct um, estimates of risk-weighted uh, capital ratios and unweighted leverage ratios for th this uh, sample of banks on a consistent basis for fully phased in Basel III requirements. So Basel III requirements in different jurisdictions have been phased in at different, at different speeds. Um, and different rates with, uh, with, I guess, the final date when everyone is supposed to be fully phased in uh, being not December 31st, 2018, but because it looks better, January 1st, 2019. Um, so that difference was, there was, a de there, there was actually a negotiation over that day because somebody wanted to be able to print 2019 rather than 2018. Uh, nobody cared, really, but... Um, okay, so here's what's happened. This is a pretty big increase. So this is, again, under the fully phased-in Basel III requirements, uh, leverage ratios are up three percentage points, unweighted leverage ratios, and uh, risk-weighted assets are up, up uh, more than six and a half percentage points on average across this entire sample of banks, okay? So if you look at this and you say, well, you know, is the world, is the financial system more resilient today than it was in 2006 or 2007? I can't go back that far, by the way. 2009 is, is the best you can do with this. Um, the answer is yes. It's much more resilient. There's much more capital in the system. There are much higher buffers, not just, not just here, okay? Um, now, if I look across if I look across different regions of the world, um, I see, also I see fairly big, uh, fairly big increases. Somewhat, the, the, the interesting thing about this picture, and the only reason that I'm showing it to you, is that the increases in the emerging market countries have been smaller because their banks actually had much more capital to begin with. Um, you know, there was this great moment in 2008 when I was in a meeting and there were all these people from these central bank governors from around the world and the, and the emerging market guys, one of them stood up and said, this time it wasn't us. <laughs> you know, so that, that was, uh, they were, I mean, they were getting, they, 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 were, they were suffering, right? Because, of course, they're suffering from what's happening around them, but, uh, but they weren't the cause of it. Um, so the, the other thing is that we can actually look, people have looked and asked, how do they do this? So there are two ways that you can, well, more than two ways, three ways, I guess, that you can raise your capital, risk-weighted capital ratios, right? Okay, so you have this, you have the, you have the capital level that can go up, or risk-weighted assets could go down, but risk-weighted assets can go down in two ways. They can either go down by having the riskiness of your existing assets shrink, so the size of the asset, overall asset stays the same, but their riskiness falls, what, what people refer to as risk density, um, or the uh, total level of assets themselves go, uh, go down. And in different parts of the world, uh, different things happen. This is a bit complicated to look at, but um, the black dot is the amount that things went up. You can sort of see, can you guess, yeah, I guess these things are reasonably visible. I should have picked something besides black to go on top of blue, sorry. Um, um, and um, what you see, so the, the blue part here is the amount of increase as a consequence of raising capital levels. These capital levels were raised by, uh, by retained earnings um, 
as well as by external capital raising. The red is what happened, what the contribution of the size of your balance sheet was to this. And the yellow is this risk density thing, which doesn't do much. But the interesting thing here is to notice that in Europe, balance sheets shrunk. That's what it means for the red bit to be above the line, okay? That means that the, that, that balance, that the total assets contributed to an increase in your risk-weighted asset ratio, and the only way that can happen is if the total assets fall. Okay, elsewhere in the world, in fact, it went the other way, where banks were actually increasing their, their asset size. Okay, so requirements up by 10 times, levels of ratios up significantly, and the sources outside, uh, the, uh, most people, even in Europe, raise their capital levels quite a lot. So that's the, that's the sort of bottom line. Now, what happened to bank performance? I have to speed up a little bit. Um, what happened to return on assets, interest margins, and operating costs for banks? And you can get, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of information out there on this stuff. This is basically balance sheet information, so you can decide what to make of it. Um, and uh, it, because um, this is really uh, off of the disclosures. So here's what, uh, here's what return on assets look like. Uh, Sweden is in there. I should have circled it for you, but I think most of you probably know. This is, this is the, 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 the comparison you really want to make is this average 2000 to 2007, again, in black against the yellow uh, that is the 2016 number. So this is for, for the, the basically the full year of last year. And these are return on assets. And, uh, and the first thing is that you see that return on assets are basically lower. Um, that's kind of interesting. Um, there, there are a few places where that's not true. I'm not sure, uh, you know, re relative at least over the last few years. Re relative to the pre-crisis level almost everywhere. Um, but um, in the advanced economies, you generally see these numbers falling. Um, so return on assets are down. This, is, this one I find particularly interesting because in the, in the studies of the macroeconomic impact of capital requirements, the presumption is that, um, that interest margins are actually going to be roughly constant. And as interest margins are constant, if costs rise, that then, um, that then lending rates will rise. And those higher lending rates are going to result in lower lending volumes. And that's where the contractionary impact of the capital requirements comes in the macroeconomic level. But that's not what, what we see is actually not that. Um, you see net interest margins falling. Now, this turns out to be, this is, again, not, not uniformly true absolutely everywhere. Um, but the numbers, the places where, the, where, where you don't see the, where there isn't a, a sort of steady decline, um, it's a little bit bumpy, and uh, it's certainly lower now than it was in the pre-crisis period. I just want to show you, I, I was able to, um, these data exist for US banks very easily. Well, it's easy for me to get them, let's put it that way. Um, and and I, uh, I I've been I'm I'm fascinated by the fact that net interest margins in the U.S. have basically been falling for a quarter of a century. Uh, it, again, this is a little bumpy. It goes, you know, sometimes it's gone up a little bit, sometimes down. Macroeconomic conditions matter for this. The exact uh, the exact composition of the uh, of the bank sample changes a bit. You have to be a little bit, I'm not being careful at all about the fact that in 2008 suddenly uh, there were a whole bunch of people who used to be investment banks that became commercial banks. These data are for commercial banks, so that means that like Goldman Sachs was not in the earlier sample but is in the last later sample and stuff like that. But generally what you see is you see a decline in net interest margins. So this is not, this is not, I, I guess if you think about it and you say, well, you know, if competition is improving and technology is improving, one would expect to see something like this. It's sort of, in some sense, um, reassuring to see this. But the net interest margins for all, yeah, Casper? There, pardon me? Um, th this is, these are net interest, these are just net interest margins weighted by assets, right? So this is gonna be, this is gonna be total net, this is gonna be total interest, net interest income divided by, um, no, it's just the total, it's the net interest margin. It's the difference between assets and liability 
it's got nothing to do with risk. Zero to do with risk, right? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I guess one answer could be that, that somehow I'm doing less risky business or I'm better at diversification, right? That would be the other possibility. Um, I don't have the most recent numbers for operating costs. I wasn't able to find them last week. Um, but, uh, but prior to, for the data that I do have that goes through a few years ago, operating costs in the banking system have been falling. So what this allows me to do is, um, is it allows me to ask the following, the following question. Um, it allows me to ask what the incidence of this is. So if I say, oh, well, capital requirements have gone up, if I think there's a cost associated with this, there are a bunch of different, I have three sort of basic populations, three groups that could be paying for it. Depositors and bondholders, uh, sorry, de de yeah, depositors and bondholders, the people on the liability side, uh, the debt part, uh, the borrowers, the people on the asset side, or the, w I'll group together the owners and the managers uh, of the banks. Um, and given the pattern that we're seeing, it looks to me, given that lending, sp it, well, there's, another, there's other stuff that I haven't shown you that lending spreads are down um, as well. That was the net interest margin, but there's even more that I could show you. Uh, dividends are actually down and operating costs are down. So it really looks as if the owners and the managers have paid. So if I'm worried about, if I'm worried about macroeconomic impacts and I look at this microeconomic evidence over the last um, decade, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna have a hard time from the very beginning uh, thinking that I'm gonna find uh, any serious impact on the, on, the, on the borrowers and that's gotta be the mechanism through which macroeconomics is affected. So what has happened to aggregate activity? Um, so the first thing is that bank debt to GDP in uh, everywhere except for, a, except for these places on the left-hand side of my graph um, have actually, has actually uh, pretty much gone up or been roughly the same. Now, um, now I, I, I have to say that people come, and when people used to say that they're worried about capital requirements impact on lending behavior, I think the natural reaction should be that 2006 is not a good benchmark. I don't want lending behavior that looked like 2006. So don't come to me and tell me that I'm not getting lending as easily, that lending is terms and lending volumes are not what they were in 2006, okay? Um, that's not what I want. I want lower lending. Um, so in some level, maybe this is a problem, but I have increases in bank debt to GDP basically in outside of Spain, Ireland, and Portugal, okay? Now, um, so that's, that's the macroeconomics. If I go back to the individual bank behavior, um, I can ask the following question. This is all individual bank data. This comes from a paper by, uh, by Leonardo Gambacorta and Hyun Shin, um, and it looks at data from 1994 to 2012, and they ask the following question. What's the impact of bank capital on, um, on lending volumes and also on, uh, on costs for banks, the cost of debt? And the answer is that higher, um, that, uh, that, that if, I, um, if I have a, so the, this is the leverage ratio on the bottom, okay? So as the leverage ratio goes up, my capital levels go up. So higher capital is associated with higher lending, okay? With more lending growth. Now, I think that, um, the, the way that you want to think about this is that strong banks have lower funding costs and they have higher lending volumes. Weak banks do really bad things. Weak banks tend to lend to crummy borrowers. I, and, and what you should have in mind here is the 1990s in Japan. Uh, because there seems to have been, mo people are now studying quite actively what happened in Europe in the aftermath of the OMT announcement um, and uh, what is essentially a regulatory forbearance in, in the Euro area f that started in 2011. And what, you're s what they're finding is the same thing happened in 
continental Europe as happened in, uh, in Japan, which is that, um, that you get zombie, ba zombie banks lend to zombie firms, okay? So they want to keep each other alive. So my, my line on this is strong banks lend to strong borrowers. That boosts growth. That's good. Weak banks lend to weak borrowers. That not only hampers growth, but it reduces the resilience of the system. It reduces the resilience of the system both for the banks, which are now even weaker, and for the, um, and for the real economy, because now you have a misallocation that's occurring because you're keeping alive firms that should not be alive. So, um, so what are the implications what are the implications of this? Um, and, uh, and this is a little, and then I'll finish. I'm taking too long. Um, the implications of this, you want to think about this. First of all, what's the implication for the level of capital in normal times? And what are the implications for time varying capital requirements? And, and I'll be very ki quick on what's the right level. So my view of the right level of capital, I don't really have time to talk about all of this. Okay, so let me. Uh, this is an interesting picture. Comes from an IMF. Uh, comes from an IMF study, uh, and uh, it, it asks the following question: What would the level of capital have had to have been um, if I look across the the post 1970 financial crises, banking crises across the world, in order to avoid public losses, public sector losses? Um, and, uh, and the answer turns out to be that to absorb 90% of crises, you need risk-weighted asset ratios of about 30%. Um, uh, which I should say is not hugely different from what capital plus this, uh, this total loss-absorbing capacity debt stuff looks like. So it's not that. Um, but my view is that the right level of capital is probably higher than we have now. And I think that we ought to raise capital requirements until we start seeing some real effects. Um, and the two things that we would see, which we have not seen, is constraints on credit supply. Um, credit is still available to people who should be borrowing. <coughs> um, and a migration of intermediation outside of the regulatory perimeter in a way, specifically in a way that increases systemic risk. I would warn you that not all shadow banking activity, not all activity that migrates from banks increases systemic risk. A lot of it goes into, s into things that are basically equity financed or not, not very highly leveraged or very small, and it's hard to argue that those things are somehow systemically bad. Um, and on time varying capital requirements, I'm not a big fan of these. Um, the, the question is what they're supposed to do, and I guess the, um, there are two possibilities that people have suggested. Possibility number one is that they're supposed to, um, that they're supposed to constrain credit, and number two is, is that they increase resilience. And I'll, I'll just quickly say that I don't believe that they can do the first. So capital gut buffers are for resilience. So just to conclude very quickly, capital requirements and levels are up. The incidence of higher capital requirements, if they have any private costs, are probably on the owners and the managers of the bank, not on the borrowers and the depositors. And as a consequence, the macroeconomic impact uh, has been extremely small, if any at all. And the implications are that the cost of raising capital requirements further appear to have very small social costs. Um, and, uh, and that if you do want to get in the business of having time varying capital requirements, make sure you think about it as a way to increase resilience, not as a way to control credit. So I'll just stop there after taking too much time. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So I'll try, I have a number of slides, I'll try to be quick, but I don't really disagree with anything I think that um, Stephen said, so I can, can be quick in that sense. My plan is to, um, is it, F five? Yes. Is, sorry, my plan is to, uh, to give us 
to uh, give a Swedish perspective on what Steven said, I think. Uh, and also to comment on a few other uh, questions that are listed here that are related to, to the question about the, the macroeconomic impact of uh, capital requirements. Things that we uh, talked quite a bit about here in Sweden. So th the first two questions are those that Steven in particular raised. Are banks safer today uh, than before the crisis? Uh, do banks need more capital? Uh, and what would be the consequences, mac macroeconomic consequences of higher requirements? Um, one thing that, that maybe the Riksbank uh, debates with other authorities and, and the markets here in Sweden is if, if there should be a leverage ratio requirement or not, or if they should only have risk uh, rated uh, requirements. And another thing that I think is important to consider for a small country like Sweden uh, is how much we should try to do on our own and how much we should uh, try to rather influence only international uh, regulations and, and stick to those. So first, are banks safer today? And in the data that uh, Stephen showed, the conclusion was clearly, I think, yes. Uh, banks have more capital, both if you look at risk rated and uh, at the leverage ratio, unweighted capital. In Sweden, I think the situation is a bit different. Risk rated capital has increased much more in Sweden than uh, the global average. So the global average, I think, is uh, was it a bit over 10% uh, risk rated in Sweden? It's more than 20%, up from uh, a bit less than 10% before the crisis. So here it's up by, I think, uh, 12 percentage points rather than 6.6 .6 in Stevens data. But if you look instead at the red line, uh, just capital divided by total assets, bank capital over assets, uh, not risk rated, the increase is very modest. So in Sweden, what has happened is clearly that risk rates today are much lower than before. And it's not because uh, the balance sheets have uh, been uh, uh, ha are smaller, rather the opposite actually. Banks have much more assets today than before the crisis, so there has not been a credit contraction at all. It's not really that the assets are less risky either. To some extent, I think it is. The, the fraction of mortgages is a little bit higher today than before, and mortgages have very small risk rates. But the uh, fall in the risk rates is totally dominated by new assessments of the same risks as before. So this is basically a development of the Basel II uh, a framework, I guess, with more internal models and banks more and more setting their own risk rates and developing the, the methods to, to assess the risks. Um, I'm pretty sure that without the Basel III uh, requirements and the add-ons that we have put uh, in addition and, and before the full implementation of Basel III, uh, um, the leverage ratio would have been clearly smaller than, than it is today. So I think that there has been effects from the Basel III requirements, but otherwise there would have been a sharper downward trend in, in the leverage ratio. So then the uh, other question, do banks need more capital? Steven said yes, definitely. The Riksbank also says yes, and we have a recommendation. So this statement is taken from our recent uh, financial stability report that we published, I think, two weeks ago. But we have had similar statements, uh, recommendations uh, for a number of years now. We think that we should have a leverage ratio requirement in Sweden uh, at 5%. So today the average for the four major Swedish banks is around 4.5%, I think. It has increased a bit. So th this is not really, we, we are not really saying that they need a lot more capital, but at least a little bit more capital than, than they have. So, so what would be the macroeconomic costs of uh, forcing banks to, to have more uh, capital. In principle, as Steven said also, there are no obvious costs to society, no obvious macroeconomic costs. Most of the costs are private, but those are because of various subsidies uh, from the government, like, like implicit and explicit uh, guarantees, and because of distortions in the tax system that effectively we subsidize debt finance over equity finance. Uh, 
in practice though, uh, those distortions are still alive and uh, we, ha we have to consider them and, and implement regulation that, that is consistent with, with the distortions or to change the distortion. So in practice, it's not obvious that there would not be costs. And I think also that the evidence that we have seen about what are the costs, I is the evidence is rather mixed. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to this in the next slide. But, but I think the important thing here is also that the consequences of uh, regulation, risk weighted or unweighted, uh, will vary from country to country and from situation to situation, depending on how effective or how important those distortions are, for example. So if, if we consider what we have learned over the, the recent years, the, so uh, immediately after the crisis, there were a number of studies, like those initiated by, by Stephen and the, the uh, BIS, for example. The Riksbank also had a study in, published in 2011, etc. Um, we have seen what, what happened after the crisis. And uh, one thing that we have learned is that I, I think most people today think that uh, crises are more, financial crises are more costly to society than we thought uh, five or ten years ago. The, the, this particular crisis in Europe has been more persistent and problematic uh, and also related to a weak banking system. Um, there's also some recent <coughs> empirical studies that or at least one, but uh, one rather important, I think, that indicates that actually forcing banks to hold more capital would not reduce the, the risk of crisis happening. But importantly, it seems as if well-capitalized banks and countries with well-capitalized banking systems, they w when the crisis hit, it's much less problematic. Um, and also, as Stephen said, that, that it does not seem like there is a credit crunch when we force banks to, to hold more capital, rather the opposite, that uh, hel healthy banks can uh, lend more. So, so those are things that we have learned. And another thing that I just want to mention without the conclusion is, is the, the resolution framework. So now we are trying to implement this MREL framework in Europe or TLAC uh, globally, that banks should have more bail-inable uh, liabilities, more liabilities that can be converted to equity, etc. So how should one think about this in, in when we talk about capital requirements? Uh, uh, my view, and I think it's the Riksbank view, is that this is not, is not fully implemented yet, uh, or almost not at all implemented, and also it's not really tested. So I, we are a bit uncertain about if we can rely on, on such capital or not. It, it is, I think, important that ba banks actually hold through bank capital, equity, etc. Then the, the question about why do we uh, suggest the leverage ratio requirement? Why not only rely on uh, risk-weighted requirements? I think risk-weighted requirements in principle are better, and we should make sure that those are the binding requirements. So I'm thinking of a leverage ratio requirement as a backstop in particular, uh, and in particular to, to um, capture tail risks that we cannot really identify with the risk weighting system. Things that haven't happened before, that we haven't seen in the data, or that happen very infrequently and that are dif difficult to, to capture in, in the models that, that we use to, to calculate uh, risk weights. Um, but, but it's not that I think that that's the only thing that we should have or that that should be the binding requirement, rather that we should make sure that the other system, the risk weighted system, is is the binding system by making that uh, more strict than, than today. And then the international perspective. I, I don't really have any uh, good answers here, but, but I just want to mention that this is, of course, important. Uh, so uh, is it motivated for Sweden to, to deviate in terms of regulation from other countries, maybe because our uh, bank system is larger uh, than, than in other countries and would pose larger risks for, uh, for the country if bad things happen, or maybe because we see that uh, regulation in our neighbor countries is not strict enough because they have these huge problems still in the banking system and cannot really uh, enforce stricter, well-motivated regulation. But on the other hand, if we do this in Sweden, a small country, uh, banks are international um, and uh, we need also level uh, 
uh, playing field and, and the bot artifacts on competition, etc. So, so those are open questions where which I think are important to, to continue to, to discuss and think about. So I stop there uh, to give some time to the next, Martin also. Thank you. Uh -huh. So <coughs> thanks for, for having me here. Um, this is really a favorite topic of mine to debate. So I'm, I'm very sorry that I only have 10 minutes to, to talk, but I'll, I'll try to be as brief uh, as possible. Uh, Perry mentioned what I'm doing, but I think the, the most important thing that I'm doing in, in this context is that I'm uh, part of my job is to be responsible for the internal capital allocation at Handels Bank. And so I'm basically responsible for how we allocate capital to different businesses uh, and so forth. And, and since we're having about 20% roughly of, of lending in, in Sweden, I think also the, the, the perspective that I'm giving that supposed to be more of a, a practitioner's uh, uh, perspective is. is probably quite valid from a macro perspective as well. And uh, uh, as, as we typically want to do in a, in a debate like that, uh, I would like to focus on, on the things that I, where I don't uh, disagree with, with Steve. And I, I disagree actually with quite a lot of what he's saying, but uh, I think it's more interesting with the things where I don't uh, disagree. But I, I'll actually start with one where I do uh, agree with, with him, and, and that is the notion on, on how um, capital requirement actually works in a bank uh, and, and the sort of the proposition that strong banks uh, lend and, and, and weak banks don't. don't. Uh, and I think that's, that's really valid because I think the way it works in, in practice is that if we have, as long as we have enough capital in, in, uh, in the bank, uh, we, if we get higher rec uh, capital requirements, that will basically be uh, something that affects the, the, the cost for our borrowers. We will basically raise our interest rates because it's it's a cost for us to have uh, more equity requirements. And as long as we have capital, we are providing lending. The only thing that happens is that, that prices are, are going up. Um, but it, it's quite binary. When we get into a situation where we have, have uh, don't have enough capital or that we really have to care about capital, for instance, if there's a crisis or if we are doing losses, and also if capital requirements are going up very quickly and we have a trouble with, with uh, <coughs> reaching those uh, requirements, uh, then we would definitely react quite differently. We would like to bring down assets. We would like to, to stop a, 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 all the lending. And, and that's typically the way it would work in, in banks. And I think the, the, the figures that, that Stephen is showing as well is, is quite supportive of that, that you see in those countries where you have had more of a, a general uh, uh, problem like this in, in, for instance, Spain and, and uh, Ireland. Definitely assets have gone down, and banks are not really able to provide credit. But uh, <coughs> Uh, that is probably what you should expect. Then I think it's, it's very important when you look at this from a macro perspective that the time that we have had since uh, uh, the crisis, the last 10 years, has been extremely uh, different in, in many ways in, in, in the sense uh, that we have, a, uh, have perceived such a huge uh, lowering of, of the interest rates. So uh, any effect that you would see on, on higher capital requirements would ba basically be wiped out uh, by, by the lowering of interest rates. So just to give you a sort of concrete example, I, I think it's fair to say that a, uh, a good uh, corporate borrower would probably pay around 6% interest rate uh, before the crisis. And now they're probably paying around, let's say, 1.5% or, or so. So basically going down with, with uh, uh, four times so <coughs> or something like that. <coughs> While at the same time, capital requirements have been going up, but as Steve, Mo uh, Steve was mentioning, uh, I think that the number 10 times is probably too high from a Swedish perspective. Uh, I would, I've been thinking about this and also looking at the, uh, the Oliver Wyman study that was done a year ago from, from a Swedish perspective. Then you're talking more probably about three times or something like that. And, and the greatest difference with, compared to the numbers that Stephen are showing is that we, we never had uh, as much. Uh, non-equity capital in, in our system. We were only allowed to have like 15% of non-equity uh, in, in our uh, tier one um, ratios. And then we were also, basically nobody uh, could have 4% capital requirements. So we were having around 6, 7%, and I think that was sort of a, a, a in practice, a, a restriction that we had. So probably everybody had to have at least, uh, I would say 50 to 75% uh, over and above the requirement at the, in those days. So, so I think probably a number of three is something is, is more fair. And then you, if you just look at the relationship here, even though capital requirements have gone up very, very much over this time, the interest rates have just been coming down even more. So, so the net effect on, on the borrower's perspective would definitely be that 
interest rates have been coming down and, and obviously credit supply uh, would not be affected really as long as there are banks that are able to borrow of course and, and I think it's fair to say that in Sweden uh, I mean we've been lending very much all, at all times uh, other banks were probably restricted over, over maybe one or two years in, 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 the, in the crisis but over the long period of time that has not been the case so I think it's very difficult to, to assess this in, in sort of a, uh, <coughs> a really uh, fair way you have to think about the macroeconomic environment so <coughs> the other very impo important and interesting question of course is is capital too high <coughs> uh, and uh, I guess it, it doesn't uh, come to a surprise that I'm, I'm disagreeing with Stephen on, on, on this point um, but I think one I, I'm of course looking at this from a Swedish perspective and I think one big difference uh, in, in Sweden compared to sort of the rest of Europe or the rest of the world is that we we probably have around 40 50 percent higher uh, capital requirements already uh, uh, compared to other countries um, uh, and maybe Stephen would be happy if, if we were raising all the capital requirements with 40 50 percent for everybody um, and <coughs> that number basically comes from from the from the notion that most systemic banks in Europe has to have if you include pillar two requirements around 12 percent uh, uh, requirement from from um, uh, the their their authorities while we need to have sort of 17 18 if, if you adjust for mortgage risk risk weights and, and and some stuff like that so so i think probably we are at around 40 50 percent higher than, than the rest of the europe and the rest of the world at this point so so maybe that's uh, uh, also an important uh, difference um, of course so, so when I'm I'm looking at, at Stephen's condition, which I think are, are very interesting and good, but whether we are at too high capital requirements, I would basically tick the boxes on on both his his uh, issues. Uh, the first one was that whether uh, there, the the monetary policy would be able to to sort of have an impact on on credit uh, supply, and I think when we are where we are in Sweden today, we basically have uh, no interest rates at all, zero interest rates uh, at this point. It, it's all about pricing, but if we are getting into a, a worse situation or if interest rates are coming up, uh, there, <coughs> there wouldn't really be much room for, for, for uh, um, uh, changing uh, uh, interest rates in a way so it actually affects the credit growth. So I think uh, it's quite likely that in, 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 more, in the downturn we wouldn't really see, uh, <coughs> we would see restrictions on, on, on the credit supply maybe as well. And the other point about disintermediation. Uh, I think we're definitely at the point where capital charges are so high that everything that is possible to, to get out of the bank's balance sheet, uh, you, you're definitely doing that. So in Sweden, for instance, on the large corporate side, we see very strong moves uh, where all large corporates that are able to, to borrow on the markets are, are basically doing that. Uh, I was looking at figures, if you look over the last four, four years, um, uh, about 62% of all new credit growth in, in, in the corporate sector in Sweden came from borrowing at the markets, uh, on bond markets, 38 came from banks, and then you should remember that we have a lot of SMEs that can't uh, borrow on markets at all. So we have a very strong tendency to where large corporate credits are going to, to bond markets, definitely going in, in the direction of, of uh, where, you, where the US is. And you can also see the, the same sort of incentives, even though we haven't seen that development that much. Yes, uh, on, on the mortgage side, uh, the cost of having mortgages on, on the bank balance sheets are are really quite high, and, and um, uh, if you have like an interest margin on, on perhaps one and a half uh, percent or something like that on the mortgage, and you have a capital cover cost that is somewhere between 50, 70 basis points, which which you have in the bank, but which you don't have on, on in other institutions, you would definitely have very strong incentives, and, and we've seen that in the, in the Netherlands, for instance, where about 30 percent of mortgages are now done with insurance companies rather with banks. So so the incentives are, are definitely there. Uh, we haven't really seen them materialize that much in Sweden yet, but, uh, but I think uh, they are very strong. Uh, so obviously, uh, uh, my view is that capital is definitely, uh, at the, they shouldn't be higher from where they are. I also would like to raise uh, two final uh, points, or perhaps three. Um, one thing that is very important when you talk about capital requirements, and I think the the Swedish FSA has really uh, pointed this out and, and realized is that you, you should try to make uh, capital requirements buffers in the sense that you actually can, if there's a crisis, capital can go down and, and that uh, you have, uh, <coughs> you are able to, uh, 
to use sort of the buffers in the time at the bank. Uh, uh, and so it doesn't really, the important thing is not really whether the level of the capital requirement that you have, but it's more, are you actually able to use your capital at all? Because if you, if you are not, uh, you will get into trouble at the bank immediately when, when, when there's a crisis, regardless of the level of capital. And, and I think any, any ways where you try to, to make it possible to go down uh, is very uh, positive. Um, having said that, I think it's quite difficult because in a crisis situation, markets will definitely react to you if you are, are bringing down your capital uh, in a stress situation, almost regardless of, of where, uh, where you are. But also on on notion of, of, of the cyclical capital requirements and, and counter-cyclical buffers, I think they could be quite useful uh, uh, in the sense that I think Stephen mentioned as well, that if you are able to actually take away uh, some buffers in, in a crisis or some requirements in a crisis, that could be quite uh, useful. Uh, the other uh, uh, point that I would also like to make is, is the, the big difference that we have today when we really have worked a lot with crisis management, resolution, bilingual debt, and, and all that stuff that has come up. Um, so I think uh, at this point, it's quite, uh, it's quite clear to, to everybody, and, and Stephen showed it as well, that uh, the ones who are losing in the crisis is, is basically uh, the bank um, owners and probably also the bank manager. So if there's a trouble in the bank, uh, the equity will definitely be, be wiped up uh, uh, these days. And that is the most important thing, really, because it is the, the, the owners and the managers who are basically driving the bank, managing it. The incentives are important uh, for them, that they are really all there. They have all uh, the skin in the game, so to speak, when it comes to, to banks. So, uh, and, and I think we are in a situation where they will definitely lose all their money. Uh, and then, of course, you also have the, the resolution features and, and all the, the possibilities to bail in uh, both subordinated debt and senior debt, and uh, that will definitely, or has already, have had a, a quite an important effect on, on, uh, on at least if you look at pricing of bank debt, that, that um, it seems like uh, bank debt is, is priced not with any, any implicit guarantees. Uh, any more to any, any important extent. So that also brings the question on, on what are you really gaining from capital requirements if you have provided the system with all the incentives there are, and you've also made it possible for, for, for resolution authorities and others to manage the crisis well if it would uh, uh, occur. Um, maybe just a very small point also on, on, on uh, uh, risk-weighted capital requirements versus leverage ratio. I think Looking at, <coughs> at Martin's uh, graph here about uh, how leverage um, uh, rates have been flat in, in, in Swedish banks, uh, the only reason why that line doesn't uh, follow uh, the risk rated line is that the composition of, of uh, uh, loans or assets in, in, in banks have completely uh, changed over those years. So we have, uh, speaking of us, and I think the others are quite similar, we have about 15% of our, our uh, assets in, in at central banks, which is basically zero risk rate, so, so that is a huge difference. We have moved over much more to mortgages, and we have also improved the risk in our, in our portfolio, so we are lending to much less risky sources than we did uh, back then. So if you just look at the ways we are me measuring the capital requirements on the risk trend at, at 2009, you look at each type of, of, of exposure, each type of loan, uh, um, we have also increased the, the, the risk rate in our internal models over that time because of some requirements, market risk, risk and so forth. So, so uh, <coughs> that was not really, that is not a correct description of, of how it has been working. And, uh, and obviously, uh, it's, it's in Stephen's papers as well that, that if you are lending without any, uh, any risk based requirements, you will drive risk in the system because it will be much cheaper to, to lend to risky business than, than other business. And, but I, I think I'll stop there and then leave some time for, for questions. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have 15 minutes for questions and or comments. While you think about your questions and or comments, Stephen, would you like to comment on Anything that Martin or Martin said? Uh, well, I guess I, I, I'll make one, a couple of very quick comments. The first one is, is my rule of thumb was when I was doing this, 
So the, if the bankers were complaining that I was doing something wrong. So, <laughs> because, and, and that's the rule, by the way, when private costs and social costs diverge, right? They should be complaining. If they're not complaining, then I haven't gone, then I haven't gone uh, far enough. Um, and, and another thing in that same realm is I never understood why banks thought that they could be able to have the same ROEs as pharmaceutical companies. Um, pharmaceutical companies bear enormous, enormous tail risk if they start killing people. Um, they don't get bailed out by the government. Um, and so their normal time ROE could be high. Banks don't have that because I grant that there's all this other stuff. I, I, I think it's, I, I agree with, with promotion number one. Or promotion number two. Um, I, I, I agree that, that the system is untested in the sense that we don't know whether the government and the politicians are really going to allow the bail-ins to occur. It, the bail-ins are a great idea, but, um, but the, the fact is that people are going to have to pay the price if you do it, and, um, and politicians don't usually like that. Okay, please, the floor is word Thomas. You need a microphone. It's, this is being filmed and people will be looking at you and, what, and listening to you. Please, Thomas Thank Franzen. Thomas Franzen. Uh, I relate to your uh, earlier comments, yes. Uh, because uh, the, the banks in Sweden aim at a return on equity of around 15%. And that uh, seems to be a very high level. And uh, it also is an indicator of uh, the fact that competition does not function very well in the Swedish market. So I wonder what would be the impact of an increase in competition uh, meaning uh, leading to around a, a target of 10% instead, that is reducing the monopolistic structure in Sweden. Okay, before you answer that, maybe we are a bit short of time. If there are any other questions or comments, we take them and then you answer, you get a smorgasbord of questions. Please, Kasper. Microphone. You have, a, you have a microphone. I have a question to Steve. You, t you talked a lot about levels of capital, but you didn't say so much about how to get at higher levels of capital. Do you want to say something about what would be a good way to increase capital requirements, or capital in general, not, not requirements? Thank you. Okay. Could I throw in a last question then? Um, the effects of capital requirements. We don't see a whole lot on lending demand or, or lending rates, but other, Martin said, Martin Lovai said that you are removing any assets you can from the balance sheet because it's, it's expensive to have them on the balance sheet. Like banks are removing trading portfolios. Market making systems don't work the way they did because banks are reluctant to hold, hold, hold those assets. That in turn has consequences for liquidity in bond markets. Uh, we see in Holland more uh, mortgage lending done without any intermediaries, lending going directly to the insurance companies. And there are firms looking at this, trying to find new, new solutions. Do you see any sort of are there other things going on out there that could be good, could be bad, but sort of that need more consideration? It's very open question and a big one for five minutes, I realize, but, but I, I would like to hear all, all comments from all the three of you. So, was there another question? You want? Yeah, please, sorry. Bankers Association, uh, I just have one short question that uh, uh, when you look at the risk of banks versus other companies and do you price it, shouldn't you look at the CAPM model and say that the beta for Swedish banks are around one and should have about the same risk, uh, the same cost of capital as most other companies, which uh, is also the case as far as I can see from the data. Thank you. Okay, this is a lot in five minutes, but uh, who wants to start, Martin? Right. <coughs> well, I can start with the 
maybe the more simple ones and and, and the the 15% return on equity requirement, and, and, and uh, we could touch things around um, uh, <coughs> how you should think about return requirements, basically, on, on banks. And I think uh, when we when we are looking at, at capital allocation in, in the Hamas Bank, and we are looking at, or we don't have a goal of 15% of return on on equity. We have a relative goal that we want to be more profitable than our peers. So it's, it's maybe perhaps a little bit different for us, but we we would uh, uh, look at. Uh, but the way it works in, in, in practice for us is that we are we are assessing the capital requirements on a deal by deal basis, basically, and then looking at the, the capital requirements, and then we use uh, the return requirements from markets as an input in, in that calculation. Uh, and basically, that is, you know, ballpark eight percent, and then something before. If you look at the tax effect, you are a little bit about ten percent uh, uh, on as a return requirement, uh, and that. Uh, and then we're also looking exactly what what uh, what Richard is saying. What is the beta of, of us and, and others? And, and it's roughly around one. So we, we get as, as, as a re return requirement, which we, which we need uh, at a little bit more than ten percent. So we're basically there um, in that aspect. Okay, Martin. Um, don't have that much to, to add. Just uh, one comment about the. Um, the cost of our capital. I had this, this uh, thing with the market making effect on my slide. I, I forgot to say that. So I think the, the uh, <coughs> my reading of the recent literature and also listening to, to the discussion and seeing that market making and liquidity and the market seems to be lower. That, that's one effect that we didn't talk too much about uh, five or ten years ago. So, so that's maybe one thing that weighs in, in the other direction so that higher requirement is is more costly than it is, depending on what, what the assessment is of the importance of these market, market making activities. So it's, it's not obvious how problematic this, this, this is, but, but I agree that that's something that we should have in mind. Stephen, you have the okay, last so word. Yeah, this is just very, I can just one minute. So on the market making, I was going to make a comment uh, at the same time, and I'll do it now to bring that to him. Um, so I think you have to think about a couple of things here. The first one is, that, um, at least in my view, we were subsidizing market making before, and um, is that the right thing to do? Do we want to subsidize market making activity uh, because they were under capital, were basically undercapitalized? There was no capital associated with trading those activities, and you know, very modest, and, and, and so we were we were subsidizing them. The second point, I think, this is more is that when when you look at the when you look at market turnover in things like corporate bonds, it's always been tiny. So it's, again, this, now this is one of those things where you've fallen from one tiny number to a smaller, even smaller number. And it's also a case where there was never any liquidity under stress. So saying that the liquidity has gone down when it used to take you, you know, two days to trade a bond and now it takes you three. Um, and the bid ask spread is widened a bit because there's no government subsidy anymore. It seems to me is a little. That, that, I find that I find that a little bit um, a little bit tough um, to to actually justify. Casper's uh, question um, on how to get capital up. I think that the, the most important thing to do is to. Um, I mean, my own view is that we should we should do our best to force people to raise capital in, in markets when capital is cheap. So when, when you see, as we've seen, periods when when price to book is way above one, that's a great time that you should be pushing banks to raise capital because that's when it's cheap. Um, and they're first of all they're going to complain a bit less, but the other thing is that uh, in a in a sort of market and in a um, social context, I think it's um, it's generally uh, it's generally the right thing to do. You know, one final point about. Um, is it, it relates to the comment that was made about pushing things out, Douglas' comments about pushing things outside of banks. Remember, if you push things from banks into markets in terms of systemic risk, that has to be great, right? We would, I would, would love to see everything be market based, um, but for informational reasons, that's not going to happen. So I accept the fact that, that, that we're, you know, the banks are useful, they're providing a social service. 
But if I push stuff that can be pushed into market, um, then, that's, then that's good. Or if I can push things into systems where there's a, a different sort of intermediation that an intermediary is not leveraged, so a broken, a broken system, that also seems good. Because it's the high leverage that leads to the systemic risk. Um, and so if I reduce that, that's good. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm all for making huge banks thin. Um, so. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. We have run out of time. We have some small gifts for you as we show our appreciation, and we also want to give you a warm applause. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh,